So thank you, Raul. Um, thank you to this amazing panel for joining for this session, um, Games to Train the Healthcare Force. Uh, as Raul mentioned, my name is Lynn Feline. I'm the founding director of the Play to Prevent Lab at the Yale Center for Health and Learning Games. And I've got this great collection of innovators and brilliant minds, um, including Carrie Shaw from Embodied Labs, Deepika Mohan from the University of Pittsburgh, Jesse Shell from Shell Games, and Ron Goldman from Cognito. So we're gonna get to it. Carrie, uh, we're gonna start with you. Uh, just as some quick background, Carrie Shaw is the CEO and founder of Embodied Labs, an immersive training and wellness platform for professional and family caregivers and the older adults they serve. And I have to say, Carrie and I have talked about her work. I find it absolutely fascinating and so necessary. So thank you, Carrie, for being here. Thank you so much, Lynn. Hello, everybody. It's really great to be here today to get to meet all of you virtually and share what we're up to at Embodied Labs. Um, so the aging services population is incredibly near and dear to my heart. I know in Q&A, Lynn's going to ask us some questions and I'll get to share more of my personal story with all of you. Uh, and Embodied Labs really focuses on how to train the aging services workforce using the power of immersing ourselves into virtual worlds that can show us the perspectives of the people that we're caring for and also give us the opportunity as the, the caregiver, whether professional, student, or family member, to practice some of the most difficult scenarios that we'll encounter as we're caring for older adults. Uh, so next slide, please. I think we'll all get to hear from Chris Milk later on in this conference. And one thing he said that stuck with me uh, is that talking about virtual reality is like dancing about architecture. So let's jump right in with a few visuals of what we do. Um, in our scenarios, we uh, create embodied experiences that accurately portray perspectives of really common experiences that we encounter as we age. Uh, my background is first in public health education, and then I have a master's of science in biomedical visualization or medical illustration. And so when we create these experiences, we interview hundreds of subject matter experts, uh, first starting with people living with the experiences that we're creating. So in this uh, picture, you're seeing a snapshot of our experience where you embody someone that has macular degeneration and uh, also hearing loss. So one in three people over 65 experience one or both of these audiovisual impairments. And in this lab, it's called the Alfred Lab. You embody using your hands, like you see in this slide, uh, Alfred's experience. You use your voice and you're able to interact uh, in different scenarios through Alfred's uh, time with his family or here at a doctor's visit where he's being asked you as Alfred to uh, fill out a test to assess his cognitive function. Uh, next slide, please. Now this is a video clip of the Beatrice lab, which is a journey through Alzheimer's disease. All of our labs also take an approach of a biopsychosocial educational framework. So in this lab, you're actually going inside Beatrice's brain to understand what Alzheimer's disease looks like and how it progresses inside a neuron forest. And then in Beatrice's perspective, you're understanding how um, her hearing and vision changes as her whole brain is impacted by this disease. And you can see you use your voice, you're actually interacting with the care team around you, in this case, uh, your daughter, your grandson. Um, and then in labs that partner with each of these uh, embodied experiences, you practice things like how you as the caregiver might uh, calm someone down who's agitated to prevent a fall. Or in, in the next slide, in this video, you're uh, embodying the perspective of clay in the clay lab. So in this lab, we focus on end of life conversations and you actually navigate what it's like to be in a situation where you have a terminal cancer diagnosis and then you choose how you wanna proceed. Um, and this lab really focuses on end of life education around what hospice is and what that process is like. Um, in some of the partnered scenes, you as a doctor can practice breaking bad news to a patient. So you've been in the shoes of Clay and then you actually get to interact with Clay as his doctor in the reverse. 
or you get to practice as a certified nursing assistant having a difficult conversation with a family. And next slide, please. And in this final clip from another lab of ours, um, you embody a woman who is Lebanese American. In all of our labs, you also learn about uh, culture and how each of these embodied experiences have uh, people that approach their care with a different race, culture, or gender. Uh, and so in this lab, you are uh, embodying what it's like to have Lewy body dementia concurrent with Parkinsonian symptoms. And then in this uh, three-part training series, you also navigate making decisions from going from living in the home to a care community. And next slide, please. So finally, um, these are an overview of some of the clips you just saw. We just launched our most recent lab where you embody uh, the experience of being transgender, lesbian, and gay, and how that ties into being uh, an older adult. We worked with one of the best uh, gender scientists in the country for the medical animations that also are uh, part of that lab. And then next slide, please. We are uh, always really looking at key metrics of impact. I'm a little over time, so I'd love to talk more about how we measure data and analytics for how these impact our care force. And then last slide, uh, we work with all sorts of organizations from hospice to home care, senior care, county governments, and uh, many, many academic institutions. Uh, so today we're partnered with uh, over 100 subscribers to our platform, really transforming the way that we approach caring for our, our aging population. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie. That That is really phenomenal work. And I think everyone would love to hear later when we have more of a group discussion about your story and how you came to this area, because that's as fascinating. Um, so our next speaker is Deepika Mohan, who is near and dear to my heart as a fellow physician uh, doing very rigorous research in an incredibly important space. She's a researcher, trauma surgeon, and intensivist at the University of Pittsburgh. And so Deepika, you're up. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so as Lynn mentioned, I'm a practicing trauma surgeon and intensivist at the University of Pittsburgh. And I'm interested in how heuristics or intuition affects decision making. I became interested in this question one night when I was on call as a fellow. Uh, in quick succession, we accepted two patients from outlying hospitals. The first was a young girl who had flipped her father's SUV. She went to a small community hospital where she was hysterical and tachycardic, her heart rate was high. Um, and so they imaged her from head to foot, didn't find any injuries, but because of her mechanism, because of her tachycardia, decided they needed a second opinion. They put her in a helicopter and sent her to us without any images, so we had to repeat everything. And four hours after she arrived, we still hadn't identified any injuries, but now it was three o'clock in the morning, and so we couldn't send her home, so we admitted her for observation. Around the same time, we got a second admission. This was an older woman on her way to church. She'd been rear-ended, her airbags had deployed, uh, and when she went to the outlying hospital, she said, you know, my belly is really, really hurting. And they said, okay, well, let's get some images. And several hours after that, they got a phone call from the radiologist saying, scan is concerning for free fluid in the belly, maybe, have, maybe has an injury to her intestine. They put her in an ambulance and send her by ground. And eight hours after her injury, she finally arrives and she's basically dying. She's uh, hypotensive and, and tachycardic and we take her to the operating room. And in, in fact, she had torn her intestine in half. Um, she survived, but it was a very long road. She had multiple operations, kidney failure, ICU stay, and ended up going to a nursing home. So the next morning I met with my boss. We were supposed to be talking about research uh, ideas, but I couldn't concentrate. I kept perseverating about what I had seen. So on the one hand, we have the young girl who doesn't need to come to us, but is sent to a trauma center in the most expensive way possible, right? Her hospital stay probably cost on the order of $100,000. On the other hand, the old woman who needs to be with us right away, her care is delayed by eight hours. There was nothing they were going to do with that hospital that was going to fix the problem. They weren't going to send her home. So why did they why did they hold on to her for so long? So I spent the next five years uh, digging into this question, which is what my boss had challenged me to do. And I came to believe that what we were seeing was a manifestation of the use of heuristics. 
So heuristics are intuitive judgments um, that are or mental shortcuts that we use to, to deal with complexity and uncertainty. Heuristics can be powerful. Like right? think about the case of Captain Chesley Sullenberger landing U.S. Airways flight 1549 in the Hudson after a bird strike rendered both engines inoperable. It was an unprecedented maneuver. And when he was asked by the NTSB after the event how he had calculated the various parameters, what he said was, I relied on four decades of experience. I acted intuitively. So that's an example where heuristics have were saved the lives of 155 patients. On the other hand, they can also heuristics can also lead you astray. And I think this is what I had seen uh, when I was taking care of those two patients. Um, the physicians in both cases got the, the diagnosis wrong. In the one case, they overestimated the severity of injury because they were focused on the mechanism. On the other hand, on the, in the second case, they had underestimated the severity of injury. We develop good intuition when we do the same task repeatedly and get feedback on our decision making. One of the main problems in medicine, however, particularly in the environments in which I work, the emergency department and the ICU, is that these conditions don't typically uh, exist. Patients don't show up with their diagnosis stamped on their forehead. There's a lot of uncertainty. It's a rare event because severely injured and severely ill patients don't, don't occur all the time. You have to make these decisions quickly and the decisions you make in that moment will have long um, standing repercussions. Um, and so developing well calibrated heuristics or retaining them after training can be very difficult. Um, there are very, because of the complexity of the problem, there are very few strategies out there for addressing this problem. And I, I um, thought that, that coming up with a strategy to fix this uh, would potentially have a significant Im impact on patient outcomes. Um, I started reading pretty ecumenically and I came across a body of work on the power of storytelling. So stories have certain characteristics that make them very useful for this problem. They present information integrated into a background context so you don't have to learn rules in isolation. They model behavior so that you can see the consequences of different actions and they evoke emotions. A well-told story can make you sad, it can make you angry, um, and those emotional tags help to make the lesson memorable. The problem with storytelling and the reason why it hasn't achieved broader use as a strategy um, has to do with the difficulty of creating an engaging story, dissemination, and scalability. And it struck me that video games offered one option for doing this. This is the challenge that I brought to Jesse. I wanted to construct an immersive story that would communicate important clinical principles for the problem that I was interested in, which was triaging trauma patients, so that physicians could take the information they learned during the story and then transfer it to the real world. Great, so that is our, our segue to Jesse, um, who he and Deepika worked on this important project. So as some background, Jesse and Chal Gaines have been my and my lab's partner for close to the last 10 years. I can say firsthand that he and his team do the best quality, most innovative, most impactful work, and we've really benefited from their expertise on our projects. Um, he is CEO of Shell Games and a distinguished professor of entertainment technology at Carnegie Mellon University. Welcome, Jesse. Yeah, no, glad to be here. Yeah, Deepika, certainly, uh, you, you certainly set up the uh, uh, the game pretty well here. So it was really uh, uh, kind of exciting when Deepika first came to us with this challenge. You know, it, it, it would be the first time that Shell Games had really uh, focused on making a game specifically for doctors. So that was an interesting and unusual challenge. And uh, Deepika had so many strong ideas about exactly what was important about how to integrate heuristics uh, into this experience. So it was exciting to be able to work together, but it was a real challenge to figure out how we're going to make something that has the um, really has meaningful content in it when it comes to showing about heuristics, but also has to have the engaging story. Um, one of the things Deepika didn't mention was an earlier ex uh, ex experiment she tried creating a an experience that didn't really have story in it, but had the engagement. Uh, but, but had uh, doctors working with uh, heuristics trying to diagnose cases, and it was clear that it wasn't effective enough because it wasn't emotionally engaging. So 
we were looking at it, trying to find a way to do this. And this wasn't any ordinary training. Um, we couldn't simply just say, here's a training, you have to sit down and do it. This was very much designed to be something that doctors might do in their spare time. So it was important that it be, that it have appeal and engagement, that people would in, enjoy it enough to want to do it on their own, and that it have the vitamins in it, and that it be effective. So Lynn, if you could uh, play a, some of the video of, of, uh, of the game now, I can give a little bit of a sense of it. So we, we created a game called Night Shift, and uh, the concept of it is it's kind of an adventure game where you are a young doctor who has come to this town and started working in a new hospital, but there's more to it than that. You have a backstory where, where which is all about your grandfather. Um, you had this great relationship with your grandfather, and then it deteriorated. And our, our, our protagonist is, is kind of upset and bitter about how it deteriorated. And the story begins with, it turns out that the grandfather has passed away, and the doctor is moving to the town to help settle the grandfather's affairs and work in the hospital. But then it turns out there's some strange mysteries surrounding the life of the grandfather. And the doctors in the hospital and the patients both know things about the grandfather. So you can see some of the game, you, you know, you saw the part in the house there where you're kind of uh, talking to some neighbors. And but then you actually go in and you're doing real diagnostic type work. We were very challenged as as designers because there were parts of this game we couldn't play because if you are not a doctor who can diagnose emergency room patients, um, you really can't succeed at these parts of it. So we really uh, were working hand in hand with, uh, with with Deepika on this, and in order to kind of make something that blended these two together. And one of the things that that uh, we saw there was a lot of appeal from doctors uh, about was that they really could bring their actual expertise to bear, which isn't something they're used to seeing in a game context. Um, so it was uh, uh, it, it was a, a wonderful game to be able to work on, and uh, the testing has shown that it uh, has some pretty solid impact. That combination of, of effective content, practicing heuristics in an emotional context where you actually get to know the characters really seems to matter. Great, thank you. That's wonderful to have, to have both perspectives on that project. I think it's, it really shows how rich and how involved the process was. So um, our next speaker is Ron Goldman. I actually met Ron a number of years ago now, actually at a CDC meeting and have continued to follow his work. I think it's really uh, fascinating and obviously has huge value to the healthcare force. He is a co-founder and chief simulation strategist of Cognito, a health simulation company based in New York City, comprised of close to 100 game designers, writers, software engineers, and other artists. Here you go, Ron. Great, thank you. Um, happy to be here. Uh, if you can move to the next slide, I can jump right into it. So, um, as Lee mentioned, uh, we're based in New York City. Uh, there's a large team um, that has been working for the past 10 years, really with a strong belief in the sentence that you're seeing on the screen, right? The power of conversations and their ability to change lives, to improve social, emotional, and physical health. And what we decided to do and have been on this mission and journey now for, for about 10 years is really to combine the power of gaming technology, simulation technology, the science of learning with the power of conversations to really drive this change. If you can go to the next slide, I can show you a little bit more about how we, we do this. So there's a platform and a methodology. It allows us to have um, anything from teachers. In this case, we're talking about healthcare, but we've done a lot of work in K-12 and higher ed as well to engage in role play conversation with virtual humans that are coded with everything from a personality to a medical condition, right? So they're mimicking a, a real patient and have a conversation with them and choose what to say, learn through practice and personalized feedback, which is how we all learn the best and really taking a concept that works well, right? In a workshop of role play, but sometimes difficult to standardize and scale and bring it into a gaming environment. And you can see some of the core features that we have created for our virtual humans so that they are actually effective. And I mentioned they embody specific personality and attitude, as well as a medical or behavioral health condition. 
they have memory, they adapt to what you say, so each one of us can have a completely different experience with the same virtual human, depending on how we choose to manage it. We still use real human voices, so we bring in the actors. And we like to say that they're very talented because you know they never age and they can speak any language. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I, I can show you, um, well, this, these are the different areas that we have worked with. Um, we have worked with hundreds of hospitals and government agencies. These are professional development for nurses, physicians, social workers, including with continuing medical education or nursing education. Uh, in these four main areas, uh, we recently also added some telehealth interactions, right, considering that not everybody's now sitting in a room. Um, and they have been very successful for us. Uh, and I will give a lot of credit to our team that obviously has built that, but also that has collected uh, data to show the efficacy of these simulations. And I'll show you one slide at the end. So uh, a few videos, so you can see how these actually works. Uh, this is a simulation, if you can go to the next slide, um, that was designed to help physicians learn how to actually have a conversation with patients around antibiotics. Uh, this is a screen capture, so you will be able to see a little bit of this if you can hit play. Okay, we cannot hear anything. Uh, there is audio. And um, <laughs> so if you can pause it for a second, I'll tell you a little bit about what, what's happening here. So you're in this virtual environment, uh, you are making decisions of what to say. You can see that uh, once you make a decision, your avatar says it. Uh, you can choose between different tactics, the virtual patient, who is what we call emotionally responsive, is responding to you. So you're starting to have this back and forth. If, if you um, continue the video and even go to the next slide, because if we can't hear, I'll, I'll try to, uh, I won't try to do a voiceover. Uh, but um, the thing here is, is that it's obviously challenging, right? Depending on what you say, the character is going to respond to you. Every one of your decisions is getting recorded, and it impacts what happens in the next set. Right? So if I'm being nice, she's going to open up, she's going to be willing to share. If I'm just jumping into doing, a, you know, ignoring her ask and her needs and just uh, lecturing, she's going to shut down and not be very engaged. And at the end of the day, what we could do at the end of each conversation, if you keep going to the next slide, um, is to actually give you uh, a dashboard. Uh, go one more, please. Mm. Next, the next slide. So here, what we could do is, because we recorded everything that you're doing, we can give you very specific feedback on what you have done well and what you haven't done well, right? We can tell you, this is how much time you spend showing empathy. Here is how much time you could have spent. This is how long the conversation took and, and how long you could have done it if you use better conversation. Because one of the values here is to obviously reduce the length of the conversation with the patient, which is a key value proposition. So the whole idea here is to really give you um, this kind of, you know, uh, playground to choose what to say, to um, see how the different decision impact the engagement of the patient, to see that when you choose effective techniques, uh, the patient opens up, the visit is shorter, and the outcome is, is higher. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that the data um, shows the efficacy of these, right? What are we trying to do here? Um, I'll wait for the next slide. Um, obviously, yes, we care about usage and user satisfaction. We care that people want to stay here and they stay here for a long time. We sometimes will design something for five minutes and people will stay for half an hour because they enjoy talking with these characters. They, maybe they enjoy getting them upset and, and try to recover. Whatever that is, that, that's, that's uh, valuable. We obviously want to improve skills, right? Communication skills, which is what we're talking about here. We're not teaching you medical uh, knowledge. We're teaching you how to talk. Right. So seeing that those skills improve and that those sustained uh, those improvements are sustained over time is obviously very, very important. We've been able to do this again and again, but also looking at behavior change, which is really what we're trying to do here. Are these providers having more of these conversations? Are they doing in this case? More screening and does it impact everything from readmission rates uh, to help seeking behaviors, et cetera? Um, so there is obviously an increasing understanding that communication skills for healthcare providers is important. Uh, five years ago, it was much more difficult for us to break in uh, than it is now. And I think it's a great time for everyone who's dealing with game technologies and interactive learning to really look at healthcare and providers as well as patients and caregivers at home 
and find ways to help them have a better life, which is really what we're all trying to do. So, thank you. Thanks, Ron. That is really incredible work, and it's great to hear about how widespread it's become as well in terms of its application. Um, so now we have about 20 minutes, and we will have a Q&A session after we're done here, but I really wanted to pose some questions to you all as a group, um, you know, and, and please feel free to have discussion amongst you so that this is not just question and answer. Um, but my first question, and this may, I may have, Carrie, you start with this, um, but what compelled you to address this specific issue in healthcare? And as an extension of that, for those of you who've sort of described that already, are there other issues in healthcare or addressing sort of training the healthcare workforce that you're thinking about going forward? So Carrie, I'll let you start. Sure, yeah. So for me, my interest in this um, came from a personal encounter with my own mom getting diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's disease. So she started showing symptoms when I was in high school and she was in her 40s. And then she was diagnosed uh, in her late 40s. I was a freshman in college. And um, then she lived until she was 61. So she passed away just over three years ago now. Um, and throughout this more than a decade journey as a family member and a caregiver, I saw uh, just how challenging it was to really understand Alzheimer's disease and then also what it took to care for someone living with, with Alzheimer's. Uh, at one point I was her primary caregiver and was needing to hire um, home health aides to help us with her care that the care we couldn't provide ourselves. And um, actually I have my earliest prototype that I'll show you guys uh, because my mom had a left visual field deficit and I would get tired tired of trying to explain that to all the home health aides and even to myself it was just so much easier to step into perspective and we could <laughs> put on these goggles that showed what a left visual field deficit was and then we get into it why we needed to protect the left side or always remember to approach her from the right or rotate her plate so she could see all her food and finish her meal and so by stepping into her perspective we could learn about what she was experiencing be immediately empowered to have better care for her uh, and then have that empathy for for her perspective um, but what these couldn't do is really simulate the humanity and the um, some of the complexity of other things that she is experiencing. Uh, and so as I was d developing my career in public health and then later uh, went on after caring for her to be a medical illustrator, uh, this question became my thesis research in grad school and then um, now for the last four years has turned into what Embodied Labs does today more broadly in aging services. Thank you so much. That that story is really just so compelling. Um, other folks, in terms of sort of what brought you to what you described in this session or thinking about future applications or areas you want to address? Well, there, there really is so much uh, opportunity right now um, with not only have we had sort of the explosion of technology where everyone um, has access to networked mobile technology and then on top of that, the opportunities with virtual reality right now open up whole new windows of being able to create situations of uh, perspective taking and specific types of training. Um, yeah, so we're, we're exploring a number of these things. It's almost, it's almost hard to narrow it down exactly where to focus between AI and VR and uh, network training opportunities. There, there's a lot of choices. Yeah, I, I just to add to that, I, you know, I think what, what we're all experiencing is pretty much that whatever we thought is going to take five or ten years has taken now three months, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and there, there's good things and bad things in it. But one of the, um, you know, one of the things is like we know that telehealth, for example, that's not going to go away. Um, and when we look at it from our perspective, what telehealth did in a way is put one more barrier between the provider and the patient, right? So makes it now even more important, right, in terms of the specific ways that you communicate, that you build rapport, that you build trust with people 
to know now how do I do it in this way where we're not sitting in the same room. Um, so um, I, we know from clients that we work with is that these topics all of a sudden have surfaced up and that they are looking at technology as the way to solve it. So some of the more traditional ways, if we're talking specifically about education, of putting people in a classroom or you know sending them a flyer, that they're no longer a competition for us. Mm -hmm. um, there's just not an option. And so, and I think that people's just comfort with this type of media or just doing things online have just, in a way, made our life easier um, to a certain degree. And I think that yes, it is the time to really show what we can do, and, but also keep, you know, keep in mind that. In healthcare, you are assessed on your outcome, and, and if we can track and we can show, uh, this is just going to be a short episode of, of look at look at us, and then it's just going to go away. Um, so that that's important. I know that all the speakers here know this better better than me, but for everybody who's developing stuff, just please don't ignore it. Uh, we're not going to be assessed by how many people use us. We're going to be assessed by what's the outcome of these experiences. Very, very important points. Deepika, yeah, any yeah. other uh, any other recent things you've seen in the ED or ICU that you want to address? I think the, the key thing that, that I hear, I'm hearing from both Carrie and from Ron, and, and I know Jesse believes this as well, is technology is here to help us be better, right? I think one of the one of the things that was interesting in the wake of the To Era's Human Report, which was published in 1999 now is this idea that human beings are fundamentally flawed. And so what we should do is try to engineer around them, right? Let's take them out of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And yet what we know is that humans have incredible potential. And so what we need to do is to help them be the best that they can. We spend $2.4 billion a year on continuing medical education. It would be nice if some of that money uh, actually made us smarter. Um, and so the strategies that Ron and that Carrie, that Jesse have come up with, I think help us they, they take the best parts of our humanity. They teach us to be better communicators. They help us have empathy. Um, and that's that's what's really powerful about using games for this purpose. So if you can send that to me in an email, because that's so incredibly well said and so incredibly true um, and so important for the work that we create. So building a little bit on kind of what Ron mentioned about the pandemic and, and distance learning. So. You know, so we've been struggling here in New Haven at Yale New Haven Hospital with how we, you know, how we orient all our new interns and residents in in this setting, and certainly has a lot of challenges. You know, if if a lot of these new techniques that we're using stay in place, not only because of the pandemic, but just because they may make ultimately more sense, do you sort of see where your what you've created may have even greater applications or impact? for training healthcare workers? Because we may we may not be able to actually train folks, you know, even in the next year in person the way we would want. So any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, the short answer is of course, right? Um, the, I think that, you know, if you look at nursing, for example, which is a profession that's heavy uh, in its training around uh, practice hours. Um, mm -hmm. They already, a few years ago, said that you can do 30% of your practice hours in a simulation, right? Um, I think you're gonna see that trend in other professions as well. Part of it because they don't have a choice, part, part of it because there is a lot of value in this. And so, yes, I, I do think that, that that is just gonna, again, just happen faster. Uh, I think that the things that Carrie is doing are extremely important. I think that, um, you know, especially as you see the push for more and more home care. Um, I mean, healthcare, uh, there's, um, there was an expert that um, I was listening to who said, you know, we can't, um, we, we don't, we simply don't have enough providers at the end to get us out of this. So we're going to have to rely on ourselves and we're going to have to rely on the caregivers that are at home. And there are millions of people who are caring for loved ones without being paid for many, many hours a week. And um, healthcare and the government is going to continue to heavily rely on them to help, especially when they are less likely to even show up at the hospital. 
the thing that what you will see, and, and we do, if we do this a year from now, you're not going to call this provider um, educational provider training because healthcare happens everywhere, and the reliance on caregivers at home and you know non-professionals is going to just increase. So I think you're going to see more and more training actually, and education, experience, and empathy building uh, being directed to them and because they're so important. And we, we simply there's no other way to get there. Yeah, I, I think, Ron, one of the things we saw as uh, schools closed down and, and students were sent home and were no longer able to get their clinical hours in at the end of last semester, a lot of states updated those, those regulations to say that even more hours for uh, clinical students could be done virtually and that approval list of, of what can be counted as a simulation, um, I think will continue to widen and, and be a need it a need a niche a growing area for companies like ours to expand and, and meet that demand um, also i think to your point lynn of of what's to come uh, given the COVID, the post covid times uh, i i was really interested in seeing the um the way telehealth was adopted by some of our um I mean, across the board, but by home care, by senior care, and telehealth is something that really didn't have the the same adoption pre-COVID as now. It's like this: everybody adopted it within like two weeks if they had nothing in place, especially in in areas where um, like a family member or a visitor was no longer able to come in to visit their older mm -hmm. adult, um, and so they had to find ways for everyone to use video conferencing. And I think that really makes everyone now say, well, if, if we needed to adopt telehealth and we could do it as fast as we did, what other technology should we be adopting? Uh, and how can we now feel empowered that one, we should do it now so that we're prepared and two, that we can all do it, even if we don't think of ourselves as technologists. Um, so I, I think, you know, still there's a lot of time between now and seeing like what I hope is a one-to-one uh, headset adoption, and we still need a lot of infrastructure to support how that kind of education would even be deployed. Um, but we can now all imagine it. And and on more of the corporate side, uh, as everyone's working from home until whenever, the end of the year or, or always, um, you can imagine why investing in a headset, which costs less than investing in one trip to corporate headquarters, one time a year could become a really great way to offer employees something that um, gives them meaningful um, skills. So I think all around we're seeing this uh, ability to speed up tech technology um, and everyone's able to imagine the why uh, way mm -hmm. faster than where we were without this pandemic. Thanks, Gary. That's terrific. I'm going to ask you guys one last question uh, since we just have a few minutes left. Um, so, you know, we heard about, so Ron, you really emphasize the issue around measuring outcomes, which absolutely are key, you know, measuring access and say, you know, how many people, you know, use a product. But the other question is getting some type of qualitative feedback. From your users right to understand better what they thought of what you had them participate in so my question to you is have you guys received any feedback from your users whether it's healthcare providers or families or patients in terms of their use of what you've created and what kind of feedback has that been yeah um yes we we, we do i mean we do this during the development like everybody else right you, you got to get feedback um but also in the way that um, we provide our programs and users in a way are forced um, to provide um, pre a pre-survey instrument. So we will learn about their kind of baseline. And then obviously right after the simulation and, and then we come back to people two or three or four months after to kind of try to find a, a, you know, a sustained uh, impact. So we do get a lot of open-ended and, mm -hmm. and they are, you know, they are very good, and they are also really insightful because people um, love to share ideas. And if you ask them, "What do you think I can do to improve?" 
they will tell you. You may not always like to hear it, but it's good to hear it. Um, and it's been a great source for us to find ways to continuously improve what, we're, what we are doing and even come up with ideas for other scenarios that we would never think about if it wasn't for them. So, but, and I think what people really appreciate in it um, is obviously the fact that, um, you know, in some cases they feel that if um, we, we are a B2B business, right? So it's the organization makes this available to you. And I think that they really appreciate that the organization took the, not just the funding, but the time to find a solution that is interactive, that is engaging, and they didn't just drop on them the one more PDF or one more PowerPoint to watch. Um, so there's also an appreciation of, of that in terms of the work that have gone in and that their organization, again, really is investing and caring about their skill. They're not just trying to check check the box. Uh, so that's been our experience. And th there are, at this point, hundreds of thousands of feedback uh, that we have gotten from people uh, over the years. So it's, it's been really helpful. Great. Others? Yeah. I, I uh, love the framework, Ron, that you shared of how to assess someone at a baseline and, and see what changes because of that educational simulation, whichever uh, topic it focuses on. A couple anecdotes that I loved hearing are um, staff, you know, when they can they, in one case, we had a group that, that uh, was allowed to do their typical training for Alzheimer's disease uh, and kind of annual compliance. And then Embodied Labs was also an option. They had to cover that compliance training. And um, my customers said they've never seen so many people happy and lined up waiting to complete mm -hmm. compliance training. Um, it's, it's fun and it's um, exciting to get to be a part of new technology and in a workforce that's increasingly dig digital natives. Uh, working in aging services isn't always seen as cutting edge and, and this gives people a sense of uh, pride and, and meaning when they're using our, our training. And, and then some of the qualitative outcomes we've looked at are whether the post training um, makes people feel more proud or satisfied in the jobs they're doing. So we'll hear people say that this was a refresher on why I do this hard work every day and it helped me connect to that. Um, they've also said it helps them come to work with more confidence in providing care. Uh, so those are just a few anecdotes of qualitative and quantitative that really help us focus on how to um, you know, not just focus on the technology, but the, the human connections and the value that it's providing to everyone's day-to-day -day jobs. I do think one thing that's really important uh, qualitatively for the kind of game we made, which is designed to be um, an engaging entertainment experience that has content woven into it, is not all kinds of content are for everybody. We, you know, we created kind of a mystery adventure game for people who don't like mystery stories and don't like adventures, this this was this wasn't really for them, and so that's definitely a thing to think about because trying to create a piece of entertainment that like everybody likes and wants is really hard. So figuring out what's going to be the right overlap with your audience um, and what's going to be uh, sufficient that way is is really important. Deepika, you are a lot closer to the. The doctors, do you, any any stories you have about just sort of anecdotal reports there? Yeah, I think I think you made the point, uh, which is that different people have different entertainment preferences, and so one of the things we saw was that some of our audience were frustrated by the idea of having to play a game. Right, there's something morally objectionable about enjoying the experience, and so we mm -hmm. got a lot of comments. You know, why are you making us do this? And it was interesting because I, I got long emails from the doctors. You know. Uh, you know, venting about why I was putting them through this. And they would end it with the takeaway that I wanted them to get. So they learned what I wanted them to, they just resented it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And, you know, we tested this, we actually, we uh, tested the effect of the game in co comparison to, uh, you know, best practice educational strategies, which are text-based, text uh, and then nothing at all. And what we found is that the game out outperforms uh, both of those media by somewhere between 15 to 20 percent. And that, that effect 
uh, lasts for six months after exposure, one hour of gameplay is enough to change position decision making, at least on a on a validated virtual on a virtual simulation. Um, but I think the key is to allow audiences to pick their own media. So having this, uh, you know, maybe a, an adventure game for one person, but a puzzle game for another, a VR experience for a third person, role playing, whatever. Uh, and that's uh, what I would suggest. Is, I think allow people to, to, to pick. So that's great. I'm going to, I think we're just about out of time. Um, I want to thank you guys. This was an amazing discussion. I really appreciate all of your thoughts, all your hard work. We will go to a Q&A session in the impact room, which is if we can figure out how to navigate over there, we will be there for um, audience questions and answers. And again, thank you, everybody. Uh, really appreciate you being here and sharing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.